Hey folks, Adam D here, and in this video on access control, we're gonna be talking about how do you actually implement an access control uh, mechanism into a system. In previous videos, we talked about uh, the concepts of access control, authorization, why these are so important. We also talked about how do we model access control and understand the access control of a system. And now we're gonna get into, okay, so we talked about this matrix. Remember the matrix had every row was a subject and every column was an object. And at the end of that video, we talked about, and hopefully that discussion is still ongoing, about what are the benefits and drawbacks of the access control model. And if you think about this, so where should the access control model live? Uh, this is like a, a key question, right? Because if it's something that a user of the system or a subject of the system can edit and change, well, then fundamentally you have no access control mechanism because everyone can just change it and do whatever they want. Um, obviously, users need to do some ability to control the access control uh, matrix to add entries, add new rows, add rights to files that they own, if that's the way the policy works. And so thinking through how to actually implement such a thing, well, you could actually implement this just directly into the operating system itself, where the operating system has an access control matrix. Every time a subject wants to access it, um, it then checks it in that table and um, and and has kind of everything centrally located there. Uh, this actually has a lot of drawbacks. Um, and so there's two basic um, models that have come out where really, and the really cool thing is they actually relate directly to the access control model. So one is um, access control lists. And so this is where basically the column of each of the matrix is kept with the object itself. So stored with, let's say in this case, the file F, there is a uh, a list that specifies the access control to that object F. And so in this case, process P has read, write, and ownership, and process Q has append. And so similarly in this list, if there's processes R, W, Z, X, Y, whatever, uh, if they're not in this list, they have zero access, right? Their access control list is the, uh, the access control rights is the empty set. And splitting up that matrix again for process, uh, for uh, object G, this would have process P has write R, uh, read access, and uh, and process Q has read and, and uh, ownership of that file. So this is actually um, how a lot of modern systems actually work. So the Unix model, as we'll get to, is actually a access control list model where uh, metadata is stored about each file. And that metadata is the access control list that specifies what process has access to what. Um, and so you can see this access control list is again, just these columns and they're stored with these files. Um, and so, yeah, so each column of the access control matrix is stored with the object or as metadata of the object. It, it, um, if it was part of the object itself, then if you could, let's say P could write to that object F, then it could change this matrix. That's not what we want and not what our model wants. The only people that can change this list is ownership. So it's basically, hey, as an owner, you can add and change this uh, uh, access control list as much as you want. Um, and if you think about, okay, well, access control lists are the columns. Well, what would be the other type of way of splitting that up, right? Well. There are rows, right? And on the rows of the access control matrix, you have the uh, subject and what the subject can do. So this is called a capability list. And you can think about it like, what are the capabilities of the subject? So here, each row of the access control matrix is stored with the subject itself. So this would be like process P has the capabilities of for file F. So for object F, it has read, write, and ownership. And for file G, it has read. Meanwhile, Q would have this capability list where file F has append access and file G, it has read and ownership access. And so we can see here again, similar thing where this uh, capability list isn't stored directly in the process because then maybe the process could modify it. But the operating system you can think of stores a mapping so that when P tries to do some action, it can look up this capability list and say, oh, this capability list, the P has this specific, uh, this specific access. Um, so these are the two main ways uh, that this happens. And you can see just kind of different things. 
Uh, the final way is you can actually just store a tuple, so a three tuple, so just a, a set of three elements that have the subject, the access, and the object. So this would then be breaking it out essentially rather than each row and column, each cell in that table having a set, you're breaking it out so that you don't have any sets and you just say, oh, uh, subject P has access R to object F. Um, and so depending on how this is done, you can maybe think about like storing this in a database or something of who has access to what. Um, so now that we've gone over these, we want to talk about like, what are the differences uh, in here? And one of the key things, so access control lists means that because the the access is stored with the object, right? So think of files on the file system. So the who can access and modify that object is on the file system. We need very strong authentication of subjects. So we need to know, hey, which process is which process? Like who is the subject? And if that can be broken, then that can be trivially uh, done and undermine the whole system. Whereas capability lists, we don't necessarily, we can actually um, do very cool techniques that use cryptography. And we can actually like take this capability list, the operating system, maybe even it's this operating system, or we can actually authenticate to another completely different system and say, oh, I'm P and it says, great, here's this encrypted blob of this capability list that other systems can check that you are who you say you are. Um, and so that's why for capability, we don't necessarily require authentication of subjects, but this means that capabilities have to be unforgeable. So people can't just magically create like if it's just a list like JSON or something that says who has access to what and you can just add to it that would be very bad um, and so we need to control uh, the fact that capabilities can't be forgeable this is something as we'll get we get into uh, cryptography you can think about using cryptographic techniques here to do that and the other thing is propagation so if this is a list that P can just give right this is just some blob this capability list that P has uh, P could just give that to Q, and then now Q is acting as if it's P and being able to do that. So that actually may be something you want, um, or maybe something you don't want. So this actually you get into when you look at like web token authentications, like how do you authenticate with different services? Um, sometimes the modern models kind of use these capability lists, which are pretty cool. Um, other ways uh, to think about them. So, right. Um, so access control list, right, on per object basis. So you have a file that has the rights for all the users, whereas uh, capability lists are basically per subject uh, basis. Uh, other ways to think about them that's really important. So this isn't something we've talked about directly, but there's a notion here of least privilege. Uh, this kind of came up when we were talking about how do we uh, think about authorization and trust and risk in a system. And so the principle of least privilege says you should only have the capabilities or the access that you need to do your job and no more, right? So if you don't need to read a file, you shouldn't read be able to read that file. If you don't need to write to a file, you don't need to write to that file. And in this way, you can constrain what each aspect of the system does, which helps when hackers like us are breaking into a system by restricting the capability, it makes our job more difficult. So, um, <coughs> Excuse me. So capability lists can provide for a kind of finer grained, least privilege control with respect to subjects. So you can give a subject exactly what they need to do to do their jobs to a, a few amount of objects. And specifically, this is great for like dynamic, short lived subjects that are created for just a specific thing. So with capability lists and of course, because these models all come from the access control matrix, whatever you can model with an access control matrix, you can do with an access control list or a capability list. It's just that the different models and ways of thinking about it, because capabilities are subject focus, it can be easier to do things like, hey, let's just spin up a process that only has access to append to this one file and can do nothing else. Uh, that can be a lot easier to do in a capability system, even though it's possible to do in an access control list system. Uh, another thing to think about is how easy is it to understand who has access to what, right? So if you wanted to, we talked about before, you'd want to model and understand access control so you can ask questions about the authorization policy and say, can process P ever write, can it write to this file? So think about how would you do that with an access control list or a capability list? Well, if I want to know with an access control list, if process P can access this specific file, 
I can just look at the access control list of that file, see if process P has write access. Um, and so that can be uh, access control list can give for better access review to say who does what for objects. So if I'm interested in this file, who can read or write that? It's very easy with an access control list because I just look at the list that is stored with that file, right? That metadata. Conversely, answering that question in a capability list means going through all the capabilities of all the subjects on the system and seeing if anyone can read or write to that object. So that can be more difficult. But capabilities, again, because they're focused more on the subjects, it's a lot easier to answer access review questions like capabilities are um, uh, who, what does this sub, what can this subject do? Can this subject, uh, what files can this subject read or write to? If you want to answer that with an access control list, you need to look at all files in the system that that person can, uh, that that subject can read or write to. And then that's how you would determine that. Whereas with capabilities, you just look at the capability list. Another thing to think about is revocation. So how do you remove access, right? This is something that's actually, you know, really important to a functioning access control model. Uh, as soon as you don't work for a company, they want to stop your access to all, all of those things, right? Um, and so... Again, similarly, because of that focus, right? And this is kind of, again, just helping you remember and understand the difference between access control lists and capability lists. Access control lists are better for revocation on a per object basis to say, okay, you now do not have access to this object. It's very easy because that access control list is stored on the object, whereas capability lists can be easier for revocation on a subject basis. So if I say, okay, this subject should have no access anymore, I can easily revoke that. Uh, by invalidating the credentials or invalidating the capability list or just removing the capability list. Um, cool. Okay. So when we think about like how to, how granting access, which in the models that we've looked at are when you have ownership rights on an object, you can then give other people access. So let's say P wants to grant Q read access to some file F. Well, to do that in a capability list, if we have already that F has read, write, and ownership of F, G has read, uh, P has uh, read on G, Q has append on F, and Q has read and ownership of G. We need to actually, we could do it kind of two ways. We could uh, modify and change the, act, the capability list that Q has by giving this, um, uh, by appending to this list. But actually a cooler way we can do it is cryptographically, maybe giving um, Q this capability that is signed that uh, the operating system or whoever can check that it is owned, but that P was the one that created this and that P has ownership over that object. So they can now have this, this um, capability list can include read to file F. Um, so it's just a different way of looking at things. Uh, it's I think it's kind of important to kind of start breaking down and understanding how these are actually implemented in real systems. And as we go forward, we're going to dig even more into how these things are implemented.